This is I'm Stuck, and in this video we will be looking at how the Tudor government works. So at the main part of the Tudor government is Henry VII, or the monarch, and he is the centre of this government. Now after the monarch, the next most important part of the government was the council. And the council was made up of just a small group of people, around six or seven. And the three main types of council included members of nobility, churchmen, or gentry or lawyers, such as Sir Reginald Bray and Edmund Dudley, who I'll talk about in a minute or two. So the three main functions of the council were to advise the king, make legal judgments, and look after the country. And this council could meet separately and decide key administrative issues with that when the king was not present. However, the importance of the council mainly relied on key members and its offshoot, the council learned in law, which I will talk about in a minute. So there was no official rules in the um, council, however, it was a permanent body. And some of the key figures in the government included John Morton, Sir Reginald Bray, Edmund Dudley and Sir Richard Empson. So John Morton was a man who had helped Henry VII in warning him about Richard III and when Henry became king he was made Lord Chancellor which is the king's right hand man. Now soon in 1486 he became the Archbishop of Canterbury and in um, 1493 he became a cardinal. Now he was extremely talented in financial matters and he was able to encourage the nobles to offer loans to the crown which was impre incredibly important in Henry VII's time. Now Sir Reginald Bray was another person in the council who was very important and he had been faithful to Henry VII for a very long time and he had helped him raise money before the Battle of Bosworth and in Henry's reign he was the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster which was a significant um, property which offered extra revenue to the crown. Now like John Morton he was very capable of dealing with finances so he administered um, Henry the Seventh will and he was also the brainchild of a council learned in law which was incredibly successful in um, getting this money for um, Henry the Seventh. So next the thing, talking about the council learned in law, we must talk about Sir Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley. And Sir Richard Empson was a member of the King's Council from 1494 and he also chaired the Council Learning Law as well as becoming the Duchy of Lancaster in 1504 and this was after the death of Sir Reginald Bray. So he started off as an ambition, uh, ambitious lawyer and bureaucrat and he and Edmund Dudley created this system of spies and informers who looked for misdeeds among the wealthy. Now these would make these rich people suffer financially, which would essentially benefit the crown. Now both were executed, however, when Henry VIII came to the throne after confessing that they basically extracted most of the money they earned illegally. So the next step down is the Great Council, and the Great Council was the gathering of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, and these basically met up very infrequently, only five times before. Uh, throughout Henry VII's reign and basically they just dealt with occasional wars and rebellions but they were not an essential part of the government. So one thing of great importance was the council learned in law and this was one of the main offshoots of the council and it was formed in the second half of Henry's reign in which it was, it was designed to manage the king's fiscal matters and this was basically his revenue and it was extremely e effective. It was also designed to exploit the king's prerogative rights and prerogative rights means that the powers of the monarch could be exercised without the permission of parliament. And the council learned in law introduced many of the systems such as bonds which would place the king's subjects into debt. Now nevertheless many of these cases were falsified in order to earn revenues for the crown and because it was not a recognised court of law the accused could not appeal. So although the um, revenue was gr so good, it was extremely good for Henry VII, um, it was technically illegal what they were doing and that did later lead to the execution when Henry VIII came to the throne. So now we will learn a little bit about the actual court and the household in which the government was formed in. And the royal court was the centre of the government, so it had to be calamitous to share the wealth of the crown to other countries and also to the courtiers. 
So Courtius would try to gain the support of the uh, king or other influential persons within the court to aid them with any legal issues in which they have. So basically, um, the Henry VII government was run off a personal monarchy. And this meant that the political power and influence of a courtier basically depended on their relationship with the king rather than the specific office in which they held. So accession to the king was therefore the main form of power. And the different levels to the court included the household proper, which was responsible for looking after the king and the guests with entertainment. Um, the chamber was um, presided over by the Lord Chamberlain, who was an experienced nobleman and friend of the king. And his political power was responsible for organising any court ceremonies. Now, they were considerably trusted by um, Henry VII, so it was a, sh a shock to um, Henry VII when Sir William Stanley was involved in a treasonable plot with Perkin Warbeck. Now, after this, Henry VII started to create this privy chamber in which the king could retreat to um, with only his most intimate servants. And this meant that many had um, far more direct access to the king, whereas those out of favour found it hard to regain his support. It also meant that the king was more secluded, and this was really the last decade of his reign. So, next place we need to know is Parliament, which obviously now Parliament is such a big deal, and it was a big deal in those days, but probably not as much as it is today. And Parliament was made up of the House of Lords and the House of Commons as it is today. However, it was only used a few times during Henry's reign, and it was normally used at the start of Henry's reign when he felt less secure. And their main functions were to pass laws and grant taxation to the crown. Uh, local issues could also be passed on to the king's officials by local MPs, in which there were two in each borough, and they were voted in by only the richest of people. So only the king himself was able to call on parliament, and he commonly used this right early in his reign, as we said before. And these early parliaments were focused on raising the crown revenue and um, national security. So, for example, the king passed many acts of attainders, which declared individuals of being guilty without having to go through a trial. And his first um, parliament granted tonnage and poundage for life, which was the right to raise revenue and imports and exports. Now, other parliaments would also grant the king's um, extraordinary revenue, which was basically a one-off unforeseeable expense um, of a government like a war. However, Henry VII didn't really need too many wars. Um, and the most common type of taxation was 15th and 10th, which was imposed upon the alleged value of a taxpayer's goods. So, at the bottom of the ladder, um, there is the local and regional government. And particular areas of a country were extremely hard for Henry VII to control, especially those far from London, where he was based. So, therefore, Henry had to build up this reliable network of officials throughout the country, and he used many of the nobles that he trusted, like Lord Dalbany and the Earl of Oxford. However, he also released the Earl of Surrey, who was a Yorkist, from the Tower of London to rule in the north of England. Um, now, although it was a risky choice, it did his um, loyalty was proved through his effective service. Now, Edward the Fourth had previously divided the whole country into spheres of influence, um, which were controlled by a magnate of great uh, of a great noble. However, uh, by the time Henry VII um, came to the throne, the number of nobles and uh, magnates had dramatically fallen. So instead, Henry became reliant on the justices of the peace, who were also known as JPs, um, and they were known to maintain the law and order in the countryside. And they were appointed from local landowners, and they met just four times a year at these quarter sessions. Now they would um, accuse those, uh, try those accused of serious um, crimes, except for treason. And it was although they were probably unpaid, they basically did it out um, for local prestige or a sense of duty. And Henry wanted to increase the power and responsibilities of their JPs, so he allowed them to do tax assessments, investigation of complaints against local officials, and the maintenance of law and order. So it was successful that he managed to start gaining control in areas which he would have previously found difficult. 
So thank you for watching this video. Soon we'll be talking about the finances and Henry VII foreign policy before we'll soon go on to learning a bit more about Henry VIII and the religion changes which were so paramount and pivotal in the Henry in the Tudor era. So thank you and see you soon. Bye.